Hello and welcome. This is Understanding Existentialism and my name is Mark Thorsby. In this video we're going to be taking a look at some of the work by a great phenomenological and existential philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, a French philosopher. And we'll actually see, well I'll tell you right now, he was actually a classmate, a friend, co-editor, and even political activist with Jean-Paul Sartre. So let's talk a little bit about who Maurice Merleau-Ponty was. He lived from 1908 to 1961. He was born in Roc chauffeur sur mer France. And forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that. I don't speak French. Um, he was the, his father was killed in World War I, and so he grew up without a father, um, which, interestingly enough, we find is typical for many of these philosophers. As I mentioned, he uh, went to the same school as Sartre, um, and he was Sartre's classmate. Uh, they formed a journal together, and they even formed a political party together. Um, he was active in the French resistance. Um, in 1952, he was named as the chair of philosophy at the Sorbonne in France, which is um, an extremely prestigious, probably the most prestigious school in France, and one of the most in the world. And he was the youngest chair of philosophy, I believe, to still have ever held that position. So he was something of a star in his life. He suddenly died in 1961 while he was preparing for class um, a lecture on Descartes. Um, so he died of a stroke. So it was a sudden and really tragic loss um, for philosophy. The two key works he's known for, though he wrote many things, is The Structure of Behavior, which was published in 1942, and The Phenomenology of Perception in 1945. Um, today we're going to be just looking at The Phenomenology of Perception. We'll be looking at some key excerpts. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the basic orientation, basically some of the key ideas that may be helpful in understanding where uh, Merleau-Ponty is coming from um, and how he relates to the other existentialist philosophers we looked at. And we should, you can see from the very title of his book, Phenomenology of Perception, phenomenology is his primary method. And so he comes right out of um, the work of exis other existential philosophers who, uh, such as Levinas, um, or Heidegger, uh, who are directly, and Sartre, directly influenced by the phenomenological method of Edmund Husserl. Now, ultimately, what uh, Merleau-Ponty is interested in is trying to articulate a more substantial view of human reality than is given in mainstream philosophy that is typically organized as a distinction between subjectivity and objectivity. In fact, we'll see today that becomes a primary discussion of his. The other thing here is he takes seriously the empirical studies of the behavioral sciences. So whereas we see with Sartre a sort of direct attack against, as it were, the observation that sociologists have um, in contraposition to his own metaphysics, uh, we see that Merleau-Ponty doesn't want to, he sees more of, a, should I say, a systematic incorporation of the insights that come out of behavior, the behavioral sciences. Um, the key things that we're going to see him discuss today and two key concerns of Merleau-Ponty is the issue of embodiment and the issue of perception. You know, one of the things we saw with Sartre, and Sartre talked about the body, so the body is not an altogether forgotten element in his philosophy by any means, but we'll see that Merleau-Ponty wants a deeper understanding of the degree to which our embodiment in the world, the fact that I'm here in a body interacting with the world, he wants to take that more seriously, particularly in terms of how it relates to our perception of things. Um, and that will become clear as we go through today's um, talk. Uh, we'll see he moves, as it were, from, let's say, um, the being in the world uh, position that we see Heidegger and Sartre take to a being in the being in the body in the world position. Um, so really taking seriously the way in which the body is um, a fundamental component of our perception of the world, which means that we can't just easily divorce it out of our considerations, typically in view of just looking at consciousness or something like that. So the body, when we talk about embodiment, needs to be understood as the medium for our the embodiment in the world. So when we talk about being in the world and being embodied in the world, the body is a medium for that. Embodiment is therefore not reducible to either just subjectivity or objectivity, 
consciousness or even just physicality. The body plays a fundamental role in the way in which perception is organized and ultimately the way in which our concepts um, of the world as, as the objects in the world ultimately gets laid out. And that'll be made clear as we go forward. And what this is going to mean is that perception is not just a single process or even just a relationship that I have with the world. Perception, quote, is our presence to our world and its presence to us in all modes of engagement and detachment of which we're capable. And this comes from the editor of the, of, the, of the excerpt I'm using. Today I'm using this anthology, the Norton Anthology of Western Philosophy after Kant, the interpretive tradition. But all of the quotes I have come directly from the phenomenology of perception, except for this one. Um, so that's one of the things we want to th think about perception. Perception is more originary than just being a simple process by which we take in the world. And you can think here about someone like Wilfred Sellers, Myth of the Given, as being, as it were, an analytic philosopher's take on a similar understanding. Now, the lived body. That's an important thing is when we talk about the embodiment in my embodiment, my body is a living thing. And so we have to also recognize the way in which the body is not just an object in the world that relates, but the object is a lived medium. It's a medium I'm living with and through. And so that means that we have to give our interpretive primacy. That means we're going to, as we interpret the various uh, perspectives in epistemology, in existentialism and in phenomenology, we have to recognize that, and Merleau-Ponty is going to give priority to those interpretations that are, quote, attuned to the perceptual and practical experiential character of the lived body. This is going to make more sense as we go through our discussion today. So I'm going to start with a couple excerpts and discussion of some of the things that get discussed in the preface of Phenomenology of per per Perception. The first one we can discuss is the question and where Merleau-Ponty begins is, well, what is phenomenology? Well, Merleau-Ponty says that, quote, first and foremost, phenomenology is the study of essences. Now, remember, an essence is an answer to the question what something is. We typically differentiate essence and existence. Existence is the fact that this is here. The essence is an account of what it is um, and what definitions we might give of a thing. So phenomenology is studying essences. It ultimately wants to offer an account of the way things are. And fundamentally, and even Husserl says this, the phenomenology needs to offer us an account of what it means to have meaning, what it means to understand anything, what meaning itself is. And so phenomenology is, so phenomenology is the study of essences, and Merleau-Ponty writes, and according to it, all problems amount to finding definitions of these essences, the essence of perception or the essence of consciousness, for example. But phenomenology is also a philosophy which puts essence back into existence and doesn't expect to arrive at an understanding of man or humankind in the world from any starting point other than that of our facticity. And remember here, you can think of we the notion of facticity comes first in, in our study from Heidegger. We saw Sartre discuss facticity quite a bit. Think of facticity as uh, the starting point of we are existing beings in the world. So phenomenology is a philosophy that begins with this facticity. So it's a study of essences, but it wants to understand the way in which essences have their meaning in the course of our actual lived existence. Hence, it's existentialist. And so this is why we see so many um, existential philosophers begin with phenomenology as their central method. And Merleau-Ponty even mentions what's known as Husserl's genetic phenomenology. And Husserl began his phenomenology, the, the stuff we've discussed really in both this existentialism series and in the phenomenology series, is what Husserl called static phenomenology. Static phenomenology is, as it were, our, an account of a phenomenological account of our experience, but in terms of objects in a sort of static sense. Later in Husserl's work, particularly if you're interested in his Cartesian meditations, he articulates an, a, a different sense of phenomenology, and that is genetic phenomenology. And think here, in terms of genetic, what are we talking about? You may be thinking about DNA and things like that. And that's not altogether um, inappropriate, but genetic phenomenology refers to the way in which our experience um, is generated over time. So when we think of genetic, think of generation as the key concept. And so this means that 
our understanding of our experience can be understood statically, but to really understand how meaning develops, we have to understand its genesis and the way in which it's generated over time. And so that means that, put it this way, um, what Merleau-Ponty is interested in doing is seizing upon a more genetic analysis of the way in which our perception, um, it, our, the way in which our perception develops. And so his phenomenology wants to understand the role of the body in that generation of perception. So phenomenology can be practiced and identified as a manner or a style of thinking. I've been calling it a method. Um, and that is that it existed as a movement before arriving at a complete awareness of itself as a philosophy. So you might say this is that phenomenology in Husserl is maybe not yet a philosophy in the full sense that Merleau-Ponty seems to suggest here. Merleau-Ponty adds, quote, we shall find in ourselves and nowhere else the unity and true meaning of phenomenology. So I thought that was a beautiful phrase, passage, so I wanted to put it in. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of phenomenology. Now, first and foremost, and some of this is, should be review, phenomenology is a matter of describing, not of explaining or analyzing. So when we talk about the phenomenological method, uh, what we're trying to offer is a description of our perceptions and make deductions from those descriptions. It's not a way of explaining the way it is or, or even analyzing and trying to understand its component parts but it begins first and foremost at the, as a method of description. So Husserl's early phenomenology uh, was understood, Merleau-Ponty says, as a descriptive psychology and something of a rejection of science from the start. So let's think about a little bit here. How is phenomenology potentially a critique of science? And by science, I'm thinking of the types of physical sciences um, or even social sciences that are normally thought of as a quote-unquote science, right? Well, first off, we have to recognize that subjective experience can't be reduced to being a mere object, right? So the experience I'm having is not the same thing as this object here, this pen, right? So you can't just reduce experience to being a simple object. Second, all knowledge that is gained in life, and particularly the type of experience and knowledge that phenomenology tracks, is always gained in perspectives or perspectively. Uh, we're going to see a key term here that uh, Merleau-Ponty uses, and that's the notion of perspectivism. Perspectivism is simply the idea that knowledge has, there's two parts of knowledge, what is known, but, no, but things are known always from a particular vantage or perspective. So you may, we may, for instance, we may both be looking at the same building, but we have different perspectives of it. Um, this is kind of known as perspectivism. Now, science is a second order expression of our experience. So when we do an analysis, let's say we we're doing biology or something or chemistry, right? We're trying to understand the basic fundamental laws that organize things, right? Um, but notice here is that science is, is, as it were, a second order expression of the experience we've actually lived. So the scientist who writes their papers, think of Isaac Newton who writes his work, on you know the movement of um, things in physical space that's a second order expression of the actual experience he's having so notice that that means that a more precise account of science requires a more precise accounting of our experience why because science as a second order expression of our experience depends first and foremost on our first order expression of experience or our our perception so that means that we, mean, we need to move from a passive to an active account of perception. Um, and what I mean here is that the notion perception is taken for granted in the physical sciences. Uh, and I should say for granted with scare quotes there. But it's taken as something that you can perceive and therefore you can make an observation. But notice that treats perception as just some passive structure um, that science uses. But to get at a more originary or let's say genetic understanding of perception, that means we have to think about, we have to try to articulate an active account of perception, the way in which perception is an activity itself. Merleau-Ponty writes, quote, I am not a living creature, nor even a man, nor again even a consciousness 
endowed with all the characteristics with zoology, social anatomy, or inductive psychology recognized in these various products of the natural or historical process. I am the absolute source. My existence does not stand for my antecedents from my physical and social environment. Instead, it moves out toward them and sustains them, for I alone bring into being for myself the tradition which I like to carry on. Now, think here about the way in which there's a similarity, at least I see, between both Heidegger and um, Husserl, and then even Merleau-Ponty mentions it directly in the text, right? There's a way in which phenomenology, the, char- the theme of phenomenology, Heidegger says, is back to the things themselves. We want to understand the way in which um, we are um, living in the world and the way in which my perception is moving towards the world, as it were. So it's an active thing. It's not just, we're not just sitting here perceiving and it's just coming in the eyes, right? We're not uh, passive agents. We're actually, are we as beings play an active role in perception? And so that's an important thing. So notice here is that science treats or even science treats uh, consciousness, our body as objects uh, that can be understood rather, but that treats them as passive, right? He writes scientific points of view according to which my, um, my existence is a moment of the worlds are always both naive and at the same time dishonest because they take for granted without explicitly mentioning it, the other point of view, namely that of consciousness, through which from the outset, a world forms itself around me and begins to exist for me. We're gonna see more what he means by this later, but we can put it this way. What he wants to say is that I have a body and my body plays a role in perception, and that based upon that perception in consciousness, I begin to understand the world and make claims about the world in terms of the world being objects. Right. But all of this is sort of just taken for granted in most scientific points of view. And this is why um, Merleau-Ponty thinks that what we need is a more precise account of perception itself. So let's move here. Next thing. Now, what, why isn't modern philosophy good enough here? And here he specifically mentions Descartes and Kant. Now, I'm not going to go through Descartes and Kant here, but what we can say is that if hopefully you know about this and you can take a look at my other videos if you need to, but Descartes has a methodical doubt where he says that all things that can be doubted should be doubted, doubt all things that can be doubted. And then eventually in the second meditation, he comes to the realization that I am, I exist is necessarily true whenever I think it, or to put it in another way, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. And what Descartes is known for, and the reason he's called the father of modern philosophy is because this cements subjectivity as the first and primary point of departure for understanding the world, right? So first and foremost, notice here is that for Descartes, subjectivity becomes primary and the distinction or the duality between subjective subjectivity and objectivity gets baked into the equation with Descartes. And so first and foremost, Descartes sets up a model in which that needs to be overcome from Moulin Ponty's perspective, or maybe overcomes through not the right word. Um, maybe we could say is that what we have to do is complete the project of Descartes potentially. Now, Immanuel Kant in his um, critique of pure reason makes an important distinction between the noumenal and the phenomenal. Something is noumenal if we're talking about what it exists in and of itself. All so in the, an object's num, um, an object understood noumenally is to try to understand the object the way it is without perception. Now, Kant says that's not even possible. He says all knowledge is phenomenal in its orientation, and that means that we're talking about knowledge um, or the world as perceived. So we can talk about the noumenal is the world in itself, um, apart from perception. The phenomenal refers to the world as perceived. Now, Kant, since Kant argued that the noumenal wasn't possible, only the phenomenal, this meant that subjectivity becomes logically prior to any notion of external objectivity. So the world I'm inhabiting for Kant is still rooted in the subjective um, categories of reason, which are in the mind, as it were. Now, Merleau-Ponty writes, quote, Descartes and particularly Kant detached the subject. That is, they get detached from the world. That is, they presented consciousness, the absolute certainty for my existence, for myself, as the condition of there being anything at all. So 
uh, Merleau-Ponty is going to, he's worried about this because it becomes a, um, a very, very difficult problem, which in his view, the way I understand him, distorts our philosophical understanding of ourselves and the world. Merleau-Ponty adds, quote, but the relations between the subject and the world are not strictly bilateral. Analytic reflection starts from our experience of the world and goes back to the subject as to a condition of possibility distinct from that experience. Reveal the all-embracing synthesis as that without which there would be no world. So, uh, Merleau-Ponty is suggesting here is that what seems to happen is that in the course of our analytic reflection and philosophy, thinking of Descartes and Kant here, what happens is we basically detach the subject from our experience. The experience as an important modality drops out of the equation. And what we really need to do is think about the way in which experience plays a more generative role. Uh, and that means talking about perception. Now that means that the world needs to be understood as being logically prior. Now what is logical priority? Uh, to say that something is prior is to say it comes before, right? Uh, so whatever you did prior to this came before this. Uh, logical priority refers to what is fundamental, even though they can both occur at the same time, right? So for instance, let me give you an example. I'm holding this book here, and you can see here that even though the book is on top and my hands here, they're both occurring at the same time, my hand is logically prior. Why? Because if I remove my hand, the book will fall. So logical priority refers to the conceptual priority, right? And what is prior? Not the subject as Descartes and Kant would hold, but rather the world. He writes, the world is um, there before any possible analysis of mind. So before I can even, before analytic reflection, before philosophers can even begin thinking about the world and objects or scientists, etc., there is first and foremost a world that they're living in. And so this comes before any other possible analysis. So the world is therefore logically prior um, to any analysis or philosophy about the world. So how does the phenomenological approach um, address this? Now, the phenomenological approach, I'm going to sort of put here the phenomenological approach, the real. We see that Merleau-Ponty, as I mentioned, is discussing human reality. So there's two key quotes I wanted to emphasize to you, or at least read to you. The first is he says, the real has to be described, not constructed or formed, right? We can't construct what the real is in philosophy. Rather, the real exists there, and the, the world is real, and therefore it needs to be described. So that's why phenomenology is the appropriate method here. He says, he goes on, which means that I cannot put perception into the same category as the synthesis that's represented by the judgments, acts, or predications I make about the world. My field of perception is constantly filled with the play of colors, noises, and fleeting tactile sensations, which I cannot relate precisely to the context of my clearly perceived world, yet which I nevertheless immediately place in the world without, without ever confusing them with my daydreams. Right. So, um, so we have to, so the, the, here is the world is logically prior and phenomenology is trying to understand reality accordingly by describing it. He writes further, the real is a closely woven fa fabric. It does not await our judgment before incorporating the most surprising phenomena or before rejecting the most plausible figment of our imagination. Perception is not a science of the world. It's not even an act, a deliberate taking up of a position. What perception is, perception is the background from which all other acts stand out and is presupposed by them. So the world is not an object such that I have in my possession, the law of its making, it is the natural setting and the field for all my thoughts and all my explicit perceptions. So the notion here is that perception is the fundamental background thing or operation upon which all these other things flow, including analytic perception. Now, when we talk about the real, one of the things here is to notice that truth doesn't inhabit the world. He actually says that. Why? Well, because truth is, and this is how I'm understanding it, truth is a judgment we make about things in the world. So you can't perceive the world and see truth. Truth rather comes afterwards. So perception is more fundamental in this sort of way.
Um, and there's a, um, a much more detailed account of truth than this. Uh, but I want, I want to throw that in there because he says truth does not inhabit the world, which is an important consideration here. Um, so what's the chief gain of phenomenology? Why are we using phenomenology? Well, number one, this extreme subjectivism and the extreme objectivism get united in phenomenology. So the extreme subjectivism is like what I'm describing with Kant and Descartes. Extreme objectivism would be something like what the chemist or the physicist is doing where they're understanding purely the world in terms of its objective functions or criteria. Phenomenology, by contrast, studies the intersection of our experiences in perception. And in that way, it brings together both the subjectivity of my life, of myself, but also my objectivity, or not my objectivity, but the way in which I perceive objects in the world. So objectivity and subjectivity can, become brought, can be brought together in phenomenology. He writes, the phenomenological world is not pure being, but the sense which is revealed where the paths of various experiences intersect, and also where my own and other people's intersect and engage each other like gears. I love that image here, right? We have an intersection of experiences and they they get related together and they intersect together, right? It's thus inseparable from subjectivity and intersubjectivity. Now, intersubjectivity refers to the way in which sub we exist with others in the world. So if you're thinking about previous lectures, we've looked at Sartre's notion of otherness, and he used the term intersubjectivity as well. But you can see here is that phenomenology is an essential way of beginning to untangle and understand these relationships, the way in which the, let's call it not relationships, but intersections. Now, he also mentioned earlier, right, that phenomenology is not just a method, but it's a philosophy. So there's some there's some comments he makes about philosophy that I think are worth thinking about. We don't have to necessarily try to unpack them all, but I think there's some really interesting ideas here. He writes, philosophy is not the reflection of a pre-existing truth, but like art, the act of bringing truth into being. So you can see here. If philosophy brings truth into being, then clearly truth doesn't inhabit the world because it's our perception um, that experiences what inhabits the world. And then philosophy is a way of making truth, in, bringing truth about that into being. So it's more of an art, which I think is quite beautiful. Now, true philosophy consists in relearning to look at the world. And in this sense, is a historical account, a historical account can give meaning to the world quite as deeply as a philosophical treatise. Um, and I like this to this notion here, and it follows along the lines of Heidegger, um, Sartre too, but Heidegger in particular. The way in which um, phenomenology is about learning to re-see the world and understand what it means to see the world. Um, in a historical account, that is, let's say, a generative account of understanding the generation of that, that process can be extremely meaningful. And of course, also just think of it on any historical account, a narrative accounts. Um, and there's another uh, philosopher we're not talking about, but Hans George Gadamer here, who's also very much interested in the question of interpretation um, or hermeneutics. So. There's, so there's some very interesting thoughts here about what philosophy does. And so you can see the goal of philosophy is to bring truth into being. Now, let's move here and talk about the body. And here we're going to, and again, this is a shorter video. We're just going through some of the key themes and concepts in Merleau-Ponty's work. And from the very beginning, the body plays a central role, right? So he writes, our perception ends in objects, right? So when I perceive something, the end result of that perception is the object I see. And the object constituted appears as the reason for all the experiences of which we've had or could have. So he gives the example of the door, right? He says, the door is always seen from an angle and there's never a view of the house itself. So think about it here. When you're, take wherever you're watching this video, look around you and you'll see objects, right? And maybe you'll see a door as well, right? When you're looking at a door or any of these objects, you only see them from a particular perspective, from a specific angle. Notice that what you don't see is the house in its entirety, right? You don't see the pipes. You don't see the other side of the wall. You don't see the other side of the door handle, the other side of the hinges, the bottom of the door, et cetera, et cetera, right? Notice that we do have a concept that I'm in a house and there's pipes and all of that. 
but that's not that doesn't come from perception you don't actually perceive the house in itself or in its full totality now what this means is that when we're talking about the body uh, we can or when we're talking about perception we'll start with vision here there's two objects the vision two aspects the vision has the first um, aspect that we have in our vision is the vision of the object so let's say this I'll just keep using this book as an example. So when I hold this book up, right, and you see the book, right, you have a vision of the object and you understand its structure to what itself is, what we might call its inner horizon, right? And a horizon is understood as the conditions of possibility for the perception, right? Um, so you to understand that this book is blue, for instance, is to understand part of the conditions of its possibility. But notice that while you're looking at it, the only way you you not only understand its inner horizon, you also understand it's not its outer horizon, but the horizon that's given by the contours of the objects that are in the background. In other words, while you're looking at the book, you can see the object, but you also can only see the object because it's contrasted with a background. So we might call this first aspect the object aspect, and the second aspect the background aspect. Um, and the background is an essential element when we understand the way in which an object is differentiated from other objects in the world, right? So when you're looking at the door, right? Uh, let's say when you're looking at the door, it's the other things you're not looking at that organize and contextualize your perception of that door. Now, typically when we think of vision, we just think of this first aspect. I'm looking at the door. I'm looking at the book. But notice here what's unspoken is that looking at the object also is, as it were, a looking at its background horizon of differentiation. Merleau Ponty writes, I direct my gaze upon a sector of the landscape, which comes to life and is disclosed while, while the other objects recede into the periphery and become dormant, while however not ceasing to be there. No, with them, I have at my disposal the horizon in which there is implied as a marginal view, the object on which my eyes at present fall. The horizon then is what guarantees the identity of the object throughout the exploration. It is uh, the, I think that should say central truth. I think somehow it changed to choral truth. The central truth of the impending power, which has my gaze re retains over the objects which it has surveyed and which it already has over the fresh details which it's about to discover. So sorry, there's a couple typos there. Uh, but basically what I really emphasize what I put in red here is that the horizon, this background condition, is what guarantees the identity of the object. So take for instance this. So you can see the book. Now notice that as I move, move your perception around the book, the way that perception is given is through a change in the background horizon. So this means that to see is ultimately to enter, enter a universe of beings which display themselves and they, wouldn't, they would not do this if they could not be hidden behind each other or behind me. So in other words, to look at an object is to inhabit it. And from this habitation, to grasp all things in terms of the aspect which they present to it. So now notice that this is a very, very different way of beginning than instead of beginning by talking about perception. Instead of just saying that I perceive an object, you know, its primary and secondary qualities if we're looking at someone like John Locke. Instead, I have to recognize that the identity of the object is dependent upon its being in a world so that there are background horizons upon which I can understand its limits and therefore its identity. So you can see here, this is one of the ways in which the body is really important because the body, and here he's talking about the problem of the body, but the body ultimately is the seat of my perspective, right? And the body is in the world itself. Um, giving me these perspectives, or, or rather or, um, founding them, what we might say. Okay. <clears throat> and here, we're talking. I gave the example of space in terms of this kind of perception, but it's, this is also true with regard to our perception of time. So if we're talking about temporal perception, the same thing applies, right? He writes, we, we, what we have just said about this uh, spatial perspective could equally be said about the temporal. Notice here is that when you understand that something's ha happening in terms of the present time, that present is organized by the background condition of what came before. And, and also we can do it in the other direction. 
we can understand the present in terms of its potential future too. So he writes, the present still holds on to the immediate past without pausing it as an object. And since this, since the immediate past similarly holds its immediate predecessor, past time is wholly collected up and grasped in the present. The same is true of the immediate future, which will also have its horizon of imminence. So this is what we, we call, and he's getting the language here from Husserl, the double horizon of retention and protention. Um, and by the way, one of the ways you can think about this is think about the ways in the way in which our perception of time is um, perspectival, right? So we like to think of time in terms of there being a clock, the, everyone's clock is running at the same time, etc. But that's not how things go. Notice, for instance, that if I, if someone asks me a question, um, or if someone uses the word at the present time, they use that phrase at the present time, I don't necessarily know what that means. So if someone says, if I'm, let's say, um, there's, there's racers running around a track and we're timing them, right? And I say, I say, at the present time, you would expect me to say something like at this second, right? Or something like that. But notice here is that what if someone emails me and they say, um, can, um, can you meet with me right, in my office hours or something? And my response is, I can't because at the present time, I'm in a meeting. Notice that being in the meeting is a different uh, amount of time. It's not a second. It's the whole duration is be being in the meeting. So the present is organized according to our subjective perspectives. I shouldn't use the term subjective since he doesn't like that. Um, but the present, so it's the same is true for both space and time in our perception of it. There is always a horizon of retention, retaining the background of what came before and the protension, recognizing what the immediate horizon of the future looks like. Um, so that means that, and, and again here, space and time are always fundamental things and they're always linked together. We see this in Kant and we see it here as well. Now that means that perception is a synthesis of these horizons. Because notice here is when I'm perceiving the book in an ordinary sense, um, I have I don't just perceive just this one perspective and then, oh, there's another one, but I really perceive it as a whole. So, right, because I see the book moving and I see the background horizons, all of this is sort of taking place at the same time. And so that means that perception is a synthesis of these horizons. It's a combination of them, an intersection of them, if you will. In perception, we can never take up more than one facet of an object, right? So at any one moment, I can only um, in, have intentional direction towards one object. This is the notion of intentionality. In consciousness, we're always, we put this way, consciousness or awareness is always, as it were, consciousness of something. But that of is an object, and I can only understand one object at a time. So I can't see multiple perspectives at once. Now, it's by means of horizons, rather, that my gaze is directed towards all the other facets of the object. So while I'm, so you can see here what the um, front cover looks like, and here's what the back cover looks like, but notice that you can't see the front cover anymore, right? But it's through the means of horizons and that synthesis of horizons that you can direct yourself towards the various aspects or facets of the book or the object. Quote, thus the synthesis of horizons is no more than a presumptive synthesis, operating with certainty and precision only in the immediate vicinity of the object, right? The remote or surrounding um, is no longer um, with, within my grasp. It is no longer composed of still discernible objects or memories. It is an anonymous her, um, horizon now and capable of bringing any precise test, incapable of bringing any precise testimony and leaving the object is in, leaving the object incomplete and open as it is indeed in perceptual experience. I apologize. I realized that the quote there is off. It's because I was using a dictation software, which I thought was doing better than this. Um, but basically, what is he saying there? He's saying this synthesis is a presumptive synthesis, right? We're presuming this synthesis because it's through, it's only through this that I'm able to grasp all these things. But notice that my ability to grasp an object is only given in the immediate vicinity. When an object's out of view, when I take this object out of your horizon, and let's say in two weeks when you go to think about this and it's now farly removed from your, your horizonal view and you can't perceive it, 
right? It no longer, um, it becomes an incomplete object, open as it were, and you have to think like, I need to go back and see it again to really know what that cover looked like. Now, when we talk about the objective in the full sense of the term, the way in which say a physicist would talk about an objective object, right? Um, we're thinking of an object without perspective. Now, if we wanted to have perfect perception of an object, that would require an infinity of perspectives, right? It would require us recognizing everything at once. We can't do that. And we already talked about that with the regard to the house. So that means we don't have an infinity of perspectives. We don't have perfect perception. So here's what we need to do. And I put this in blue is we have to consider the body uh, to consider, let's read this. Let me read this better. To consider the body as an object among other objects is to ignore the structure of perception. So when I think of my body as just being another object in the world, the way this pen or the book or the door are, then that means I am ignoring the way in which my body plays a real fundamental role in terms of my perception and its generation. He writes, the positing of an object, therefore, makes us go beyond the limits of our actual experience which is brought up against and halted by an alien being. So when we have a purely objective account of something, right, that account begins first and foremost with our per, with the perceptions we gain perspectively rooted in our body. But ultimately, that object object as an objectivity transcends our actual experience, right? It's layered on top of it, as it were, right? So that means, so he writes further, obsessed with being and forgetful of the perspective of perspectivism of my experience, I henceforth treat it as an object, that is, I treat my body as an object, and write, and I reduce it from a relationship between objects. I record my body, which is my point of view, upon the world as one of the objects of that world. So to think of my body as just an object is already um, to take a stance in objectivity which is skipped over perception. This is the problem of the body, right? So this means that the in itself, when I talk about a being in itself, this is a function of perception, or rather it's a consequence of the function of perception. He writes, the whole life of consciousness is characterized by the tendency to posit objects, since it's in consciousness, that is to say self-knowledge, only insofar as it takes hold of itself and draws itself together in an in, a, in an identifiable object. So put it this way, if we're talking about the body, the body offers us the, the seat of our perspectives, but it's in consciousness, it's in the mind that ultimately I develop this tendency to posit that the world is full of objects, right? Think about just the mystery of the fact that even though you're not seeing all the perspectives of the things around you, you're treating them as being objects, right? Um, I, I think of the example of, um, in these old movies, old Western movies, they would just build the face of a building, but there was no building behind there. How is it that you can know for sure that the objects in your perception actually have a backside? There's something to them. And you can see here, you can't know it simply from your perception. That is your perspectival perception. So my understanding of things as being objects in themselves is rooted in consciousness, which ultimately has to begin in some way with the body for perception. So what we must discover, he writes, we must discover the origin of the object at the very center of our experience. We must describe the emergence of being and we must understand how paradoxically there is for us an in itself. And you can see here a direct relationship and, um, to Sartre's discussion of the in itself. And uh, though we're not gonna really talk about the for itself. so. He's using the term in a little bit wider sense, I think, here than Sartre did. <clears throat> so let's take a look at part two, which is called The World is Perceived. And in particular, the theory of the body is already a theory of perception. So simply understanding the body brings us to perception. He writes, our own body is the world as the heart is in the organism, right? Um, it keeps the visible spectacle constantly alive. It breathes life into it and sustains it inwardly and with it forms a system. So the way in which you have a heart and your heart is beating and keeping things going, that's what our body is doing for the perception of the world. It's keeping it all alive for us, right? Uh, it's no mistake that if we injure your body, 
like if I if our if we become blind, for instance, um, then our our understanding of the world becomes impoverished, and that's because the world because the body plays this let's call it this beating role that keeps perception alive and ultimately keeps the world alive. Right? He says our world is our body is in the world as the heart is in the organism. So it's absolutely essential and fundamental. The object in itself, as we mentioned, is never seen. So he gives the example of a cube. And so I have a little picture of a cube here. He writes, from the point of view of my body, I never see as equal to six si the six sides of a cube, even if it's made of glass. And yet the word cube has a meaning, right? The cube itself, the cube in reality beyond its sensible appearances has to have six equal sides. That's the definition of a cube. And so when I see a cube, I don't actually see that though. He writes, as I move round it, I see the front face, hitherto a square, change its shape, then disappear while the other sides come into view and one by one become squares. But the successive stages of this experience are for me merely the opportunity of conceiving the whole cube with its, equals, with its six equal sides, six equal and simultaneous faces the intelligible structure which provides the explanation of it. So take a look at this cube I've got on the screen here. Notice that w you don't actually see it as a cube. In fact, you see, for instance, you don't even see that there's six equal sides when you look at it. We see three faces, right? This dark face, a little bit lighter face on top, and a white face on the left-hand side, and we see shadows and so forth. Now notice that we're able to understand that it is a cube, but that is not something we're perceiving. Um, with the body because as we walked around it and assuming we could walk around it we would be constantly seeing new perspectives and new faces so the sense that it, there are six equal sides is as it were a derivation in consciousness um, that comes out of our perception but is not given in the perception so the unity of an object is conceived it's not experienced the unity of an object is conceived, it's not experienced. Now, Merle Pondy doesn't talk about this because he's really just thinking about perception and objects at this point. But I think this is important. There's a way in which we can even apply this to ourselves and the people in our world, right? In a certain sense, like even take for some, for instance, someone you know, you know well and you've known them for a long time, right? Uh, they obviously exist in the world, but notice that your experience with them is always given through these concatenations of perspective as well. You don't actually experience someone the unity of a person you conceive of it and that's the same is true for myself um, when i conceive of my own identity in time i don't actually experience myself uh, and well maybe myself is a hard one because i am the means the medium by which i'm experiencing but i don't actually know myself in terms of experience it's rather a consequence of conception but this follows through accordingly along all the way down the line for any object, at least of any object in the world. Objects are conceived, they're not experienced. So there, so here he talks about the dogmatisms of perception, right? He says, quote, there is a first order dogmatism of which analytic reflection rids us and which consists in asserting that the object is in itself or absolutely without wondering what it is, right? So uh, one uh, dogmatism of perception is that the object just exists there, right? But there's another dogmatism of, of perception, he writes, which consists in affirming the ostensible significance of the object without wondering how it enters into our experience. So what Merleau-Ponty is trying to do here is show us, um, or at least highlight, the ways in which we take perception all too simply. Um, and we sort of have a dogmatism that where we conflate, as it were, what's conceived with what is perceived. Okay, let's move to the next one here. So what is the role of the body in perception? Well, the thing in the world are given to me along with the parts of my body, not by any natural geometry, but in a living connection, comparable or rather identical with that existing between the parts of my body itself. So this is an important thing. It's not a natural geometry, but rather it's a lived connection. So put it this way, perception, since it takes these concatenations of perspective that then become the, as it were, the tools that we conceive objects as being in themselves on, right? Um, we have to also recognize that the, the body, 
is my the the role of my body is a living connection to the world right it's dynamic he writes external perception in the perception of one's own body vary in conjunction because they're two facets of one and the same act so the the when i perceive things externally and then i perceive my body these are ultimately they're both happening simultaneously because the body is integral to every external perception he writes every external perception is immediately synonymous with the certain perception of my body. Just as every perception of my body is made explicit in the language of external perception. So the theory of the body image is implicitly a theory of perception. Now, um, oops, there's a little spelling error at the top there. But here I wrote, understand ourselves and perception. Why does all of this matter for Mula Ponzi? He writes, by thus remaking contact with the body and with the world, we shall also rediscover ourself. Since, perceiving as we do with our body, the body is a natural self and as it work, uh, works, the subject of perception. So what this means is that ultimately there's a much more fundamental understanding of the way in which our body plays an integral role in our phenomenology of existence and notice why is this existentialist you may be asking this because this is an existentialist video because notice is that my body is a part of the facticity of my lived condition first and foremost my conception of my identity is not that's a concept right and if we begin to recognize the way in which our bodies play an existential role in the development of perception then that means we can on the one hand, philosophically avoid this extreme differentiation between subjectivism and objectivism, and ultimately even get a better, a more originary conception of the grounds upon which science originates, but we'll ultimately also understand ourselves because we'll recognize that our perception to perceive is simultaneously to, un to reveal something about myself. Now, this is just a couple of the thoughts we've been talking about, and Merleau-Ponty has a lot more to talk about I'm not going to go through all of that. I just wanted to use this video and this reading as a way to show you the, um, the emphasis on embodiment that comes out of some of the later existentialist philosophers, such as Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Now, um, even though I've taken this from this Norton anthology that I've been using as a thing, all of these quotes, despite my spelling errors and mistakes, um, come from the phenomenology of perception directly that's translated by Colin Smith. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. I hope this gives you some sense about um, some understanding about the themes and arguments related to Maurice Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys online.